Marcelo Pajiris, visiting us from the University of Cincinnati. And he'll tell us about geometric constraints on the space so when it comes to superconformal field theories. Thanks, and thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, I'll talk about uh, some work that I've been doing actually for now. This particular project is sort of turned out to be a much larger project than initially thought. I, I actually started this project here at a conference in, on formal field theories that you guys hosted. I can't remember if it was two or three years ago now. But anyway, that was time. Three years. It was three years, it was three years ago? <clears throat> and the idea is a, is a pretty simple-minded idea, which is, um, can you just, uh, in the class of four-dimensional, n equals two, supersymmetric field theories, or let's stick to formal field theories. Um, they have moduli spaces of vacuo with tightly constrained geometries, constrained by the low-energy supersymmetry. Can we just classify those geometries and use the, the, the allowed possible geometries to put some constraints on the space of allowed conformal field theories? <coughs> so, um, that's what I will talk about that program, if you like, here. And you'll, you'll quickly see that it um, it's, it's, turns out to be fairly difficult and rich, even if you make very uh, tech, you know, simplifying assumptions to look just at low-dimensional uh, modular spaces. So, <clears throat> so first of all, this is work that's going to, at least the first part of it is going to appear very soon. Uh, this is work with two students, Matteo Latito and Young Chalu, and a postdoc, Mario Martane. Um, I'm going to start with these first three sections are going to be a kind of review. I'll first just outline the problem and remind you of some very basics about moduli spaces and n equals two theories in four dimensions, and then um, tell you some details uh, that have been known a long time now about. Uh, the representation theory of n equals two superconformal field theories, and about the classification of scale invariant moduli spaces, um, and then we'll see that what the, the way to make progress is we actually have to do, to classify deformations of scale invariant moduli spaces, and that's where all the fun starts. And and you have to try to match those up with the constraints on them from looking at possible n equals two deformations by local operators. Um, n equals two superconformal field theories. So these next uh, few sections are, contain some of the new results. And uh, the uh, key thing that I want to say is that we'll see that um, the mathematical theory of just deforming, uh, of classifying the ge these deformed um, moduli space geometries is not a really a mathematically well-defined question. These are not manifolds, they have singularities. And you need to you need some physical inputs on, a, on the ways in which you, what the rules are for what are physically allowable deformations of singularities. And uh, so there has to be some new physical input. And um, we've come up with a simple conjecture, which seems to, well, I'll prove it try to outline for you, in some sense, what evidence we have for this conjecture. But in a nutshell, the conjecture is the statement that there are no dangerously irrelevant operators in n equals two quantum field theories in four dimensions. Um, uh, we have, I think, fairly strong evidence for this conjecture for the class of quantum field theories, which have rank one Kuluma branches. We have much less evidence, but no counterexamples you had for other such things. And then, um, in the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, trying to lift some of the technical assumptions that we made and see what happens. And I'll try to be clear about what are the physical conditions that we derive and what are various conjectural conditions that appear in the literature or the ones that we make ourselves. Um, there are some sort of hidden con assumptions or conjectural conditions that people put in this whole uh, game, which are turn out to be actually quite restrictive. 
<coughs> so here's the problem. We want to systematically construct the moduli space geometries of these four-dimensional field theories, and the motivations are that so far all our constructions for these moduli spaces are ad hoc. There are some set of special techniques. And you might ask yourselves, what possibilities are being missed by these techniques? You know, we have some very powerful looking tools like, you know, Kyoto or S-Class and so forth, but we know that those don't capture all the theories. They only capture some special subset of them. Uh, maybe maybe there, are, uh, there are other ones that are missed, you know, ones that aren't connected to Lagrangian theories, perhaps, by RG flows or by s dualities. Um, and then, more basically, how do you connect the moduli space geometries, which are just code for the low energy effective actions of these theories, to the microscopic superconformal field theory data, the spectrum of operators and OPD coefficients? And this is a very basic question, which, and a long standing question in field theory, for which we really don't even know. We have only, uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit in this context what we do know, but it will be clear that we know very little about the answer. So, and like I said, oops, sorry. The strategy is first classify the scale invariant moduli spaces, which would correspond to the moduli spaces of a conformal field theory, and then, and then classify the possible deformations of those moduli spaces, which should be in some correspondence with some set of deformation operators or deformations of conformal field theories. So, <clears throat> um, these, the simplifying assumptions that I'm going to be forced to be making, well first one, when I talk about moduli spaces, I'm going to end up only looking at the Coulomb branch. That's because the Coulomb branches persist after deformations, whereas Higgs branches don't in general. So uh, you can't even really formulate these questions intelligently on the Higgs branch. It turns out that Higgs branches play an important role, but I'm going to sort of sweep those under the rug for the purposes of this talk. The other drastic simplifying assumption is that I'm just going to, uh, when the going gets tough, I'm just going to restrict myself to one-dimensional Coulomb branches. Um, in which case, this kind of picture that I'm showing here, is, um, is two-fisted, um, uh, is literally true. They will look, they are just, one complex dimensional, so they look like real cones and their deformations. Um, the other thing is that I will um, assume that the, the Coulomb branch geometry is regular, which is a very technical assumption, which is often implicitly assumed in, in, in discussions. All the S-class geometries are regular geometries. They are ones in which the um, there's, there's a holomorphic symplectic structure associated to a special Kähler geometry, and we assume that it's non-degenerate at the singularities. I mean, it's non-degenerate on the generic ones, but we'll also assume. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. But there's this extra, um, somewhat mysterious technical assumption. It doesn't have any clear physical. Um, <clears throat> so here's a lightning review of the setup. Uh, so there are Coulomb, there can be various branches of the moduli space, Coulomb branches and Higgs branches, and, and mixed versions of those two. The Coulomb branch is where the vector multiplet complex scalars get VEBs, and the effect, the geometry, the geometry on the Coulomb branch is special Kähler. Um, and so it's locally in R complex dimensional variety. Um, the Higgs branch is where the two complex scalars of uh, hyper, uh, neutral hypermultiples um, get VEBs, and then the geometry is hyperkähler, so locally it's H for turnionic dimensional change. And then mixed branches are things in which, uh, which have both kind of hypermultiple and vector multiple VEBs. I'm not going to say much about that. Um, and like I said, since we're going to focus on the special Kähler geometry, let me just remind you very quickly about special Kähler geometry. It's a Kähler 
um, geometry, but there exists special coordinates, a, a 2R holomorphic component vector, which doesn't have to be single valued, but can suffer electric magnetic duality monotropies. That is to say, it can jump by elements of S by elements of SP2RZ. And it satisfies an integrability condition, which basically says that these, this, this combination of derivatives of these guys it is a symmetric complex holomorphic matrix. Therefore, it also trans has jumps, transforms by fractional linear transformations. And these are the things which are the low energy D1 <coughs> to the R couplet, gauge couplets on the, on the geometry. It satisfies positivity condition, which is just unitarity from the low energy theory point of view. And then the Kähler metric is just given by the imaginary part of this tau ij matrix. So, but the, the conditions are, are, are these three conditions. Um, when we go down to rank one cases, the conditions become very simple. The integrability constraint is trivial. So um, all that, in the end, uh, you, you can ignore the existent, the, the independent existence of the special coordinates and just focus on this single uh, tau of u, which transforms by these fractional linear transformations. SP2z just becomes SL2z. So the monodromies, the, the, the possible jumps in uh, tau are governed by uh, two by two integer determinant one matrices. And for future reference, these are generated by these three matrices, S, T, and minus the identity. Um, so by continuity, the monodrome, if I go around closed loops on the Coulomb branch, the monodromy will just be trivial unless I, uh, it, unless I uh, surround a one or more singularities. And, we, and so, um, there will be a characteristic monodrome, an element of SL2Z associated to each singularity. So overall, this is a one complex dimensional manifold, I mean, with singularities, and, um, and, the, and you impose the existence with a choice of this section tau. And this is not very constrained. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it is acting on the on really there exists a, a choice of these sections, so so that's not trivial. And from the point of view of the low energy theory, these, these sections have physical meaning; they enter into the central charges. Um, so it really is SM two Z and not the SM two Z. That keeping track of this sign is physical. Um, <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, and the other thing to say is that um, uh, non-singular um, uh, special Taylor geometries are flat and are, bo are boring. So all the interest in special Taylor geometries are things which are not actual manifolds. They have these singularities. Um, and maybe just to remind you from and in terms of the physical interpretation, the singularities are where there are extra light charge degrees of freedom, charge with respect to the low energy U1. So there are singularities in the, in the low energy theory just because that's, those are places where the low energy effect of action is breaking down. So they are the places where something interesting is happening physically as well. Okay. So now we want to look at scale invariant moduli spaces and connect them to um, the representation theory of, of unitary n equals two superconformal field theories. So you don't have to memorize this table, but there is some classification of the unitary positive energy representations that the n equals two superconformal algebra from long ago. And there's this naming convention that I'm following from Dolan and Osborne, which seems to be standard. And the, the thing I want to, that there are various, you know, general multiplets and they satisfy certain shortening conditions or they have null states and they're 
And it's the ones at the bottom of this, uh, this list here, which are kind of chiral multiplets and these kind of body chiral multiplets, which we want to focus on, in particular, um, uh, that are going to play an important role. Um, and uh, well, okay. So why? Because when we we, we can make a direct connection between um, scalars in scalar primaries in these multiplets and the operators that get uh, vacuum expectation values on the modular spaces. So um, in, it's because these uh, it's these multiplets which have definite U one R and S U two R charges um, whose whose scalar primaries uh, form uh, chiral rings in the, in the local operator algebra. And, and uh, uh, certainly a necessary condition for an operator to get a vacuum expectation value is that it, it's those vacuum expectation values form a chiral ring. Right? Um, in other words, if an operator phi gets an expectation value, we want that the operator phi squared's expectation value is the square of the expectation value of phi. Um, so those ones in greens, the chiral operators indeed could correspond to uh, fields which could get VEVs on Coulomb branches, and the ones in blue could get VEVs on these branches. Um, the other interesting thing is that the, these B hat operators, these Higgs branch operators, which have R spin, SU2 R spin 1, necess they contain in the multiplets uh, flavor current algebra generators, and therefore they actually automatically, their scalars transform in the adjoint of the flavor symmetry. Um, so that, together with some OPE selection rules, immediately tells you some things about um, uh, how, what, how flavor symmetries can act on the various branches of any n equals 2. Uh, normal field. And there's also, of course, unitarity bounds from their dimensions, which tells you about the possible allowed bounds on the spectrum of dimensions of operators on these branches. And in addition, of course, there it's a conformal theory, so it has a scale of variance. Um, so they become uh, special Kähler or hyperkähler cone. The moduli spaces will be special Kähler or hyperkähler cones. The vertex of the cone will be the conformal vacuum, and then the other ones are vacua where the scale invariance is spontaneously broken. And the um, and the because there's a U1 R action on the Coulomb branch or an SU2 R action on the on the Higgs branches, these things are not are not just real cones, but like I said, special cable or hyper cable cones. So this all, this, this is the extent to which the, 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 the formal field theory operator data and the, the geometry on, the, on these, um, on the moduli spaces fits perfectly. Um, and there have been various conjectures in the literature about um, trying to make this correspondence stronger. They more or less correspond to making an equivalence between the conformal field theory chiral ring and the coordinate rings on these various branches. Um, uh, if well, We certainly know that if you have, say, a, a Coulomb branch coordinate ring, then there must exist a corresponding operator in the conformal field theory. But there is nothing that tells us that the arrow goes the other direction. And and it's still an open question how to determine whether a given uh, operator in a, uh, in a conformal field theory, a given scalar, say, um, can, is allowed to get a non-zero value. Right? This is just a, a very basic question in conformal field theory. What property of the conformal field theory data tells us when a scalar corresponds to a flat direction or not? Okay. So now again, Restricting to the rank one case, so we're just talking about one-dimensional special Kähler cones. Well, because they're one-dimensional, they're just the cone part. There's no non-trivial base. So all they are going to, all they by by the scale and U1R invariance, 
all they can look like are flat, complex cones. So they can be just described by some deficit angle. Um, and they're, of course, because they're special Kähler, there will also be some associated SL2Z monitoring associated going around the, the, the singular point, the vertex of the, the cone. And if you put that, these, this, these conditions together, together with that unitarity constraint, you find that there's now a, um, a, uh, a, a, a certain set of allowed uh, geometries. There's ones with positive deficit angles. These are the seven allowed scale invariant cones. Then there's kind of an infinite series of cusp-like geometries, um, which are actually, if they're scale invariant, they're singular everywhere, so you would have to resolve them with, by putting in a subleading correction to, this, to scaling. And then there are ones with uh, negative deficit angles, in other words, negative curvature at the tip. Um, and these ones form a dense set. But all their, but it turns out in these cases, all their dimensions are less of the, of the parameter on the Coulomb branch is less than one. So they, they violate the unitarity constraint from the conformal field theory. So at the level of special Kähler geometry, of just the constraints of n equals two supersymmetry, it's unclear what, what's wrong with these geometries. But if we want to match to n equals two conformal field theories, we say there's, there should be an extra constraint that these should, should be removed. So there is a, so either you could simply remove them by hand and say no negative curvatures, let's say, um, at the tips of the cones, or there's this other, this regularity assumption that I mentioned before, and that's implicitly assumed uh, in many places in the literature, and it's the, 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 the regularity assumption actually removes these unwanted ones, but it's, they're not in one-to-one -one correspondence with all the geometries that satisfy this uh, condition. In other words, there are irregular geometries which fall into this class of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Some of them are orbital folds, but some of them are not. These guys, um, the deficit, deficit angles, so these guys are, you know, I don't know what to call that. Um, so, so the, you, these geometries are not constructed. The, the relationship between the deficit angle and the monogamy is not as simple as a simple orbital folding by you know, the fact that this generator, the sixth power of this generator is the identity. It's also true that the sixth power of this monogamy generator is the identity, they, but they give two different uh, kinds. So I'm, I'm not telling you the details of this. This is actually the mathematics of this classification of, with the regularity condition is, it happens to precisely uh, coincide with an old classification of the singular fibers of, of elliptic, possible singular fibers of elliptic surfaces due to Kodaira a long time ago. Um, here's, the, here's this classification. These, these seven here are those seven cones, and these are the two infinite series of these cusp-like solutions. Um, so I've given a lot of data here. Um, I, I, you don't, again, you don't have to uh, uh, to memorize it or anything. Um, these names here are the Kadira names, but maybe for reference, sometimes these are called H0, H1, H2, D4, E6, E7, and E8. But I'm not going to use those names, and, and these are generally called the A and D series here, respectively. But I'm not going to use those names because, as we'll see, those are sort of misleading from the point of view of the physics. Um, the uh, the, uh, the, these, the, the one n, i n, and i n star series here, um, and, and also the i zero star series here, 
they all have correspond to uh, geometries, to low energy theories, which have a, which are uh, where the physics at that singularity can be taken to be weakly coupled. In which case, we can make a unique correspondence with a corresponding uh, Lagrangian n equals two theory. So the I n series are U one gauge theories, uh, infrared free. So wrong sign beta function. And the I n star SU2 gauge theory is also infrared free. And these are the scale invariant SU2 theories. So this is not, however, a classification of the possible n equals 2 conformal field theories. So these guys, because they're infrared free, have a scale in them. This is the scale which kind of resolves that cusp. Um, these ones, these, these top seven, are actual scale invariant geometries. But this is not to say that there are only seven scale invariant n equals 2 conformal field theories. In fact, this case here is an SU, is, is a scale invariant SU2 conformal field gauge theory. But we know that there are two different SU2 gauge theories um, in n equals 2. One has four fundamental hypermultiplets, and one has one adjoint hypermultiple. It's really the n equals 4 theory in disguise, which is So the lesson is that in general, to each of these, there can be multiple formal field theories, which is known for other cases as well. So um, the question is, how do we distinguish between them? So um, what we have to do is look not just at the at the scale invariant moduli space, but at its at its its allowed complex deformations, not actually special Kähler deformations. Um, so the question is, how do we connect those special Taylor deformations to uh, the, the allowed deformations of n equals two conformal field theories? Um, so here I'm saying some things about uh, uh, some implicit assumptions that go behind this whole game that we don't. That we're just going to assume that there's no spontaneous breaking of n equals two supersymmetry, and we can kind of check by consistency. And then you can use this to argue, and I'm not going to go through the arguments, they're old, that the Coulomb branch is not uh, lifted, though the Higgs branch may be lifted by deformations. And so this, this is the reason we focus on the Coulomb branch. And then the other thing we can ask, just from general principles, is how a uh, various kinds of operators, um, deformations of a theory, of a conformal theory with a with a moduli space of vacuum, um, how do we understand their RG flows? So if I have a conformal theory and it's moduli space of vacuum, so the, con the conformal vacuum is the point that I've labeled P here, and this is some cone, right? And I turn on a small relative deformation that deform the moduli space, and typically the singularity may split or something and move around and so forth. And But what happens is I just, just deform the moduli space in a region uh, of, of size, which is given by the typical uh, crossover mass scale of, of determined by this relevant operator of this RG flow. And the asymptotic regions for a relevant operator, the asymptotic regions of the Coulomb branch are not deformed. This just follows from you know, sort of general re reasoning about what the meaning of a relevant operator in a conformal field theory is. And, and if I deform the theory by an irrelevant operator, what that means is that the region close to the singularity is not deformed, but the asymptotic regions of the, of the moduli space would be deformed. Um, so this is a, a different picture of RG flows from the usual way that you're, you, know, you see it in textbooks, where you think of it as an RG flow between fixed points. And the only flows you have from the UV fixed point are from, by turning on a relevant operator in the UV, which flows and becomes an irrelevant operator in the infrared. Um, here, each fixed point theory, I mean, the beginning and end points of the flow, have a, is a theory along with its whole moduli space of vacuum. And so, and the geometry on that moduli space, in some sense, it kind of, kind of contains a map of the whole flow. In other words, it doesn't just have, it's not a flow from a one fixed point to another fixed point. It contains a the form geometry, which has an imprint of the crossover scales of the RG flow embedded in it. 
So um, it's, it's important to kind of change your perspective and think about RG flows in this way to make sense of, of um, the story I'm about to tell. But, um, so with, with these sort of basics out of the way, we want to understand how to, def how to uh, connect specific deformations of, of these conical or stale invariant uh, Coulomb branches to specific, def specific local operator deformations of the conformal theory. So now you have to just do an exercise, which is, no, given that classification of what are the, the, you know, the, the various um, unitary positive energy irreducible representations of the n equals 2 algebra, what local n equals 2 supersymmetry preserving operators can you build out of those things then? form the conformal field theory by. So this is just following you know, a similar thing done in the n equals 1 case by Green, Kolmogarsky, Cyber, Weck. So a while ago. So it's a little more complicated because there's more, uh, you know, there's more R symmetries to keep track of. But in the end, you find a short list of allowed n equals 2 deformations. Um, First one is just the identity operator, so you can ignore it. But then they're basically ones that are inter you can kind of think of these as the analog of integrals over a quarter or two different halves or three quarters or all of n equals two superspace in some sense. And the primaries, x here, belong to certain representations. And except for the generic one, the one which is an integral over all of superspace, the other ones, if you'll notice, all belong to um, the ones that these chiral or bichiral representations which correspond to sort of Higgs or Coulomb branch operators. <clears throat> and in particular, the ones which give uh, relevant or perhaps marginal um, uh, deformations are just these, these ones over a quarter or a half of superspace. And all these other ones are, are, are irrelevant operators. So we have a very tightly constrained set of possible relevant from the n equals two formal field theory point of view of a possible set of uh, relevant deformation operators. Um, they basically um, break themselves up in, into three different kinds here. Um, one of them are precisely, uh, there are certain descendants of the operator which contains the uh, flavor symmetry current algebra in it, and which I said, because of that, they carry an adjoint index under the flavor symmetry, and they are dimension three operators, so their coefficient is a dimension one mass uh, parameter, which transforms in the adjoint of the flavor symmetry, which is precisely what we see in Lagrange, certainly you see in Lagrangian n equals two field theories. Um, and this tells us, on, 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 in very general, you know, without resorting to any Lagrangian, that um, turning on these relevant operators will break our flavor symmetry to a U1 to the rank F uh, times the vial we look at. This discrete vial symmetry is actually one of the things that we can see, uh, a residual symmetry that we can see on the Coulomb thing. Um, so I won't say too much more about it, but it plays an important role in, in determining the flavor groups from the geom from just from looking at the geometry. Um, then there, a special case of these is when there is a U1 factor in the flavor algebra, in which case the adjoint of U1 is just is just a singlet. So here the masses um, do not break the U1 symmetry. And um, it, it turns it turns out that uh, you can show that these are, in this case, with an extra assumption, um, these operators cannot deform the Coulomb, uh, the, the singularity on the Coulomb branch, but can only be a shift, give rise to a shift operator. And then finally, there are a set that don't correspond to mass terms in Lagrangian theories. They have no actual analog in Lagrangian theories. Um, uh, these are these chiral term deformations, which are associated to, in some sense, to a kind of a shift on the Coulomb, on the, in the Coulomb branch 
they're irrelevant. If you have a Coulomb branch operator with dimension less than two, then there exists a relevant uh, deformation operator. And this is nice. In all the examples that have been found in various constructions of cyber wind curves and so forth, it's precisely the, 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 the set of deformations of Coulomb branches that fall into one of these three categories. So that's this nice, again, matching with this kind of implicit assumption that underlying these things are n equals 2 unitary. <clears throat> so this now, uh, uh, now, now we can start uh, trying to understand the, uh, the classification of different deformations of our scale invariant Coulomb branches. And the, the simplest is, a, is just the sort of the deformation pattern or the topology of the deformation, which says that if I have some singularity, just forgetting the details of the geometry, what set under deformation, <coughs> what set of singularities appear on the, on the right hand side? Um, and so uh, uh, using some properties of special Taylor geometry, um, you can show that those mass and chiral term deformations must split the singularities, except for that special case of these U1 mass terms, which may have, which can uh, just simply shift singularities. And then also using the fact that um, the monodromies uh, uh, can't change because they're discrete, um, you you get some further constraints from the special Taylor geometry, which we have, which has uh, no. Uh, no, we don't know yet what its direct translation into the local into statements about the local operator algebra of the n equals two conformal field theories is. However, these are constraints saying that um, the product of the monodromies around uh, split singularities has to equal the monodromy around the unsplit, the original unsplit singularity. Um, there was this fact that I glad to mention that the different Kodaira types, the Kodaira classification of singularities, was in one-to-one -one correspondence with, a, with an SL2Z monodrome, or rather its conjugacy class. And um, um, another fact is that um, because these are relevant deformations, they only deform the, the near region of the Coulomb branch, not the far regions. And for that reason, there is an, a discrete algebraic invariant of all these deformations, which, if you think in terms of cybered witten curves, is just the degree of the discriminant polynomial for the curve. It's basically telling you that the, the zeros of that of that discriminant tell you where the singularities are, and this is more or less the statement that that the degree of that polynomial can't change. That is to say, you can't. You're not allowed to bring singularities in from infinity. So putting all these things together, you can imagine just trying to at the at a first cut just trying to say, okay, I know my, my different possible singularities from the Kodaira singularity. How many, just, just try to solve these algebraic constraints and see how many of these guys there are. <clears throat> so we would call it, so this will describe its splitting by this deformation pattern. So for instance, if I started with this, this Kodaira classification again, here's the order of the vanishing of the discriminant at the singularity. So if, for instance, I had a two star singularity, has an order 10 guy, and the I1, IN has an order N. So I could imagine a deformation pattern in which it splits into six I1 singularities and one I4 singularity, for example. So you could just enumerate all the possible different deformation patterns like this. There are a lot. Of these seven Kodaira singularities, there's 383 possible distinct deformation patterns. But of course, they don't all, they may not all satisfy the S be able to satisfy this SL2Z constraint. And in fact, uh, actually that's a kind of a difficult constraint to, to classify. It's just a, it's a pain in the neck, especially when there's so many different distinct possibilities. But it's, easy, it's not too hard to see that there are many of them that do have solutions. So I don't know the exact number, but it's more than 200 of these certainly satisfy this monodromy constraint. So there are many, many possible kind of deformations and one thing to say is that there's always a maximal. The maximal deformation always exists. So in the two-star case, there would be a two-star breaking up into 10 I1 singularities.
can't split any further because that would have that would have order form that would be the, the, the smallest possible contribution to the order. Um, and in fact, the not just the these SL2s. Z monodromies, but the full special Taylor structures were, you know, explicitly constructed for all the maximum deformations on those pointers. So we know that this set, you know, at least seven maximal deformations exist. Um, so the question is, do uh, do the other constraints from from demanding special Taylor geometry cut down on this number? And the Oh, yeah, I guess that's the right place to say it. The answer is no. For every other case that satisfies the SL2Z, there is, there is a corresponding special Taylor geometry. So the special Taylor constraints do not give constraints. And in some sense, we don't really believe well, uh, that there are 200 distinct rank one conformal field theories. And maybe more to the point is the, the, the way these special Taylor structures are understood is in a, in a kind of a trivial way. So, um, so here's, here's this the, the fact. Every sub-maximal deformation, every deformation where I split it into fewer than the maximal possible number of singularity, can always be enlarged to, make, to, to be that unique maximal deformation just by adding more relevant parameters. Okay. That's not an obvious statement because constraints from special Taylor geometry are not linear, but nevertheless, this is true. In fact, we don't actually have a proof of this, but, we, but by constructing, in every case, we find this to be the case. So um, this might seem to tell you that the uh, if I, if I have a submaximal deformation, it's not really a separate conformal field theory. It's just a subclass of the maximal deformation. I've just neglected to turn on some of the relevant deformation parameters in the conformal theory. In other words, how do, how do I decide whether a given submaximal deformation is just a special case of a maximal deformation conformal field theory? Or is it should, be, should deserve to be called a conformal field theory in its own right? We need some extra information about this. So this is a, a real problem. We even know this in the Lagrangian case. The n equals 4 SU2 theory, it, well, look, the n equals 2 star SU2 theory, that, that's the n equals 4 theory where I turn on an adjoint hypermultiplet mass, that's one mass parameter, looks just like the, a, the NF equals four, the one where the SU2 theory where I have four hypermultiplets that has four mass parameters. But if I take those four mass parameters to some special values such that they only just parametrically depend, you know, there's only one independent linear combination of them that I turn on, it's the same curve. That this is you know from the original papers by Cyberg and Whitney. So the um, even there, there's no not a clear distinction between what is this. What, what is the geometry associated to the n equals 2 star theory, which is a distinct conformal field theory from the nf equals 4 theory? <coughs> so um, here's our proposed answer to this question. And first, I'm gonna, just going to remind you about um, uh, what a dangerously irrelevant versus a, a safely irrelevant operator is in, in from the point of view of RG flows. There's basically, if I have flows between P and R, you can think of them as a, a UV and an IR fixed point. There's sort of um, two different kinds of flow topologies that you could have with fixed points. Either, I, so I have, here I have a relevant operator flowing from P to R and some irrelevant operator that flows into P. If I turn both on simultaneously, I can still net, I can end, still end up flowing to the same infrared fixed point R. That would be called an I, a safely irrelevant operator in the, in the ultraviolet. If it's a dangerously irrelevant operator, it's, it's an irrelevant operator at P. However, if I turn it on and at the same time turn on an arbitrarily small amount 
of any relevant operator or a class of relevant operators, then the flow misses the infrared fixed point and goes to a different infrared fixed point. These are called dangerously irrelevant operators. Okay. It's a way of saying that if maybe the point I should make is that uh, if there are no dangerously irrelevant operators, then um, and I turn on my kind of uh, generic relevant operator at P, I'm going to flow down to an infrared fixed point, which will have no further relevant operators. Um, the better way of saying it is that any relevant operator from the, in the infrared fixed point can be reached by turning on a, uh, a, a relevant operator in the UV. When there are dangerously irrelevant operators, this is not the case. There is a new relevant operator in the infrared, this operator S here, which isn't reached by turning on a relevant operator at P, but by turning on an irrelevant operator as well as a relevant operator. So, what did, let's, instead of fixed point flows, let's think about Coulomb branch flows. What's the difference between having a, uh, let, let me do that, what I just said here, let me turn on some relevant operator and I, fix, and I split to some, my, my Coulomb branch in this way, and I look at one of these fixed points. And let's say this is a conformal theory which has a further relevant deformation, and I turn him on, and then I split the Coulomb branch like this. This is the picture of a, of a flow where S, the, this relevant operator at the fixed point R1, in fact, can be, it is descended, if you like, from a relevant operator at P. And the reason we know that is because I did not have to turn on an irrelevant operator in the flow to, to, to go down here. If it, if, it, if, if, it was in, if its progenitor, so to speak, was an irrelevant operator at P, in order to have flown, flowed down here, I would have had to turn on an irrelevant operator. And we know that turning on an irrelevant operator deforms the far region of the Coulomb range. So when you look, the, the distinction between having flows where you have dangerously irrelevant operators or, or not is obvious in terms of the kind of the far asymptotic, the, the, how the deformations treat the asymptotic regions of the Coulomb branch. So I don't know if I, I'm running out of time, and I, I don't know if I said that clearly enough. But this is kind of the, the key point that if you look, there's a translation of how flows act, of how different RG topologies of RG's flows act on uh, uh, on on, end, on fixed point theories with Coulomb branches, and the distinction between having a dangerously irrelevant operator or not is this is the translates directly into whether you're forced to deform the far regions of the Coulomb branch or the modulus space or not. And this fact that every submaximal deformation can be enlarged to be a maximal deformation of relevant parameters can be sort of turned on its head and we said that every deformation looks like this. Every time you, you, you have a deformation, like you turn on an, an extra deformation parameter, and it's always a near deformation. Um, in other words, it always looks like just turning on an extra relevant operator here. It never looks like this. It never forces you to deform the far regions of the Coulomb branch. So we can turn this around and make this into evidence, if you like, for the non-existence of dangerously irrelevant operators. Super dangerous um, operator. Can it affect the monitor at infinity? The, the dangerously irrelevant operator. Yeah. Yes, every irrelevant operator will will do that. That's just saying. After all, what does an irrelevant operator? Maybe here's the way of saying it. You know, an irrelevant. If I say I turn on an irrelevant operator, you know, you think, oh, at some level, I have an effective theory, and I'm just going to flow back to my UV fixed point. But that flow is a flow which in the, is a flow from some other UV completion now of, of the theory, which is my fixed point theory plus an irrelevant operator. So the, that's, in, in some sense, that's what this deformation out at the, in, in the far regions is telling us about. There's extra structure that's added in, which has to capture all that 
the, whatever is the new UV physics, the ultraviolet completion of that flow. It's, of course, it's actually, if all I have is if, if, if an irrelevant operator, this actually, UV, this UV completion isn't uh, specified. There are many, typically, infinitely many different UV completions. But I also, uh, you really don't understand there's a lot of that you put down the box here to the IR expert. Because the IR expert only has the universal deformations, but the only safety. So it's also an irritable deformation. Then you will not have uh, something that you follow for different IR safety. Right, so it is a property of, of, the, of the collection of, 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 of conformal field theories in question, right? And so, we're taking this as evidence for this conjecture. I mean, we, have no, we don't know how to prove this conjecture. That, in fact, there are no dangerously irrelevant operators for, for n equals 2 field theories. And certainly, it's, the way I've presented it here, this is evidence for the conjecture, at least for these theories which have rank 1 cool on their edges. But, like you said, it has, this, this tells you, basically, that uh, uh, conformal field theories, once you turn on their generic relevant um, uh, deformations, are going to flow to infrared singularities which have no further relevant operators. And actually, what the, the correct way of saying it is there's no further splittings of those singularities. So, uh, so, so now this changes the, the question in terms of trying to classify um, these allowed um, uh, deformations into saying, well, we should, we should look at all the deformation patterns, but we should only include patterns such that the resulting singularities upon deformation correspond to theories which admit no further splittings themselves, have no further relevant deformations which split the singularities. And I won't go into it, but uh, so so every upon deforming it, every every singularity is going to is going to split into some collection of singularities that are going to be in this Kodaira list. Which one of these correspond to theories which themselves can have no further relevant operators that split the singularities? Well, the, these these four here turn out always to have splitting deformations. Um, so I won't go into the argument. There, we have no evidence. There, there, it's a logical possibility that these three here could have corresponding conformal field, strongly coupled conformal field theories, which have no relevant deformations. That they're corresponding to special sort of frozen uh, conformal field theories with you know, no flavor of symmetry corresponding to each of these singularities. So. We, so, uh, short of something like the conformal bootstrap or something like that, I don't have any idea how you could could uh, determine whether such these funny frozen conformal field theories exist or not. So, either we can assume that they exist or don't. So, just for simplicity here, I'm going to assume that they don't exist. But it's easy. I can I can certainly enlarge my list of classifications by assuming they exist. I could tell you about the existence that you then find in a few more conformal field theories or a few more deformation geometries. So what that leaves in this list are these following infrared-free singularities. And so um, uh, you can ask, these guys now have Lagrangian interpretations. And so we can simply ask, in this list of U1 or SU2 asymptotically free gauge theories, which ones admit no further deformations? Or splitting or they're splitting deformations. Um, so this is just what I said, U1 and SU2 gauge theories. The answers are the following. If I have a U1 with a single hypermultiplet, massless hypermultiplet, then it's the global symmetry is just an overall U1 symmetry, and that relevant deformation does not split that singularity, it simply shifts it. So U1s with a single hypermultiplet of charge square root of n will give an IN singularity. And for SU2, something that's a little less obvious is that for um, hypermultiplets, which are in symplectic representations of the gauge group, you can consistently couple what's called a half hypermultiplet in an N equals 2 supersymmetric way in these Lagrangian theories. 
except that generally when you have um, half fiber multiplets in a, um, in a symplectic representation, you may run up against the, the, the discrete, the global Z2 anomaly, Witten anomaly. Um, so you, only, you have to make sure that there are representations which have an even index. And so in the SU2 case, this starts, these are the spin 4n minus 1 over 2 irreducible representations of the SU2. And the, the, the first case of that, when n is 1, that's the spin 3 halves representation. And that gives a, a, a frozen I star 1 singularity. So just to be concrete, this is telling us that there is a, an infrared free SU2 gauge theory with a half massless half hypermultiplet of spin 3 halves, right, which does not admit a mass, an n equals 2 preserving mass term. Certainly, if I want to break n equals 2, I can write a mass term. Right? This is a, even though it's infrared free, so we generally think it's kind of an unstable theory in the sense that you turn on mass deformations and it flows to all sorts of interesting stuff. It's, um, in this case, there's no such deformation which preserves n equals 2 super zero. So this is some little appreciated class of sort of frozen Lagrangian theories. So you can try to now say, now let me just classify, uh, I'm going to skip over this because I'm almost out of time. But let me just classify these deformation parameters, uh, deformation patterns, um, with this restriction that I, I I go to these uh, appropriate um, non-splittable singularities. So instead of those 383 possible deformations, there are only, this cuts it down to 118, still a large number. But now these are, that low energy theory is described in terms of some Lagrangian, you know, U1 or SU2 gauge theories. And I know what their charges have to be in order for them to be non-splittable. There are these funny charges like square root of n for the hypermultiplet, or you know, spin three halves in a certain normalization for the SU2 generators and so forth. And so I can compare, but then there's constraints on coming from, Dirac, from the Dirac quantization condition. In other words, if, if I have two singularities, let's say an I2 singularity and an I1 singularity at the same time, the I1 singularity will have a charge one hypermultiplet, and the I2 singularity will have a charge root two hypermultiplet. Their charges not being commensurate would not be compatible with the direct quantization condition. So that's disallowed. So you can quickly cut it down to a much smaller number. And then there was that SL2Z monodromy condition, which you can now evaluate on this set fairly easily to find that there are only 16 allowed such deformation parameters. And then it turns out like I said, constructing the special Kähler geometries works in every case. If the number here is reduced by one because there's two separate special Kähler deformations of the I star zero singularity, which nevertheless, if, even though the deformation pattern uh, looks different in, in this way of classifying it, the two uh, the low energy effective actions on those geometries are equivalent. There is simply a change of variables between the two of them. Um, this is actually the, the, the answer for the n equals two star theory. This one where you had charge root two guys in this normalization, this is the original solution of Seibert and Witten. And the one where you have kind of two charge one and one charge two singularity, this is a new solution and they're related to one another. And there's actually a new correlation of this to the SQLD transformation of these in the equals two star things. In any case, there's a nice little story there. Um, but more important in constructing the special Kähler geometries is this allows us to extract the flavor symmetry um, corresponding to each of these now 15 separate uh, informal field theories, uh, or, the, or at least these the putative informal field theories. All we're constructing, of course, are, are Coulomb branch geometries. And then there's an extra consistency condition that they have, that this Dirac quantization condition essentially has to be uh, true, not just for the generic mass deformation, but for, for all possible, even the um, non-generic deformations where you don't 
uh, break the flavor symmetry completely, but leave some non-abelian factors. And so this actually reduces this list even further. So, so I'm just skipping over some consistency condition, but here's the answer in the end. Here's the list of the scale invariant Cordaro singularities, and each entry here is a separate, consistent um, uh, deformation geometry. And uh, here are the two for the SU2 Lagrangian theory, the, the NF equals 4 or SO8 flavor symmetry, or the N equals 2 star things, which has an SP1 or SU2 flavor symmetry from the point of view of the N equals 2 super symmetry. Um, and then there's the E8, E7, E6 series, and then there's another series which was found uh, by S duality arguments uh, some years ago, and, and all the ones in black have been realized. S class, but we find one new one, and it's one of the, and it's a funny theory that involves this funny frozen SU2 theory, and we have no idea whether it exists in S class or not. So you could take this as our uh, a, uh, a, con a, a, a subject to this uh, no dangerously irrelevant operator conjecture, a classification of the allowed. Uh, rank one regular uh, Coulomb branch geometries, and therefore a constraint on the possible n equals two conformal field theories. And it actually turns out for every element of this list, we already know that conformal field theory exists, except for this, for the possibility of this one. So I guess we conjecture that there may be one more conformal field theory. Um, in my remaining negative four minutes. Let me just tell you a little bit, give you a flavor of what happens if you drop uh, the regularity conjecture. Um, so the, the, the classification uh, scheme that I just told you sort of goes out the window once you allow irregular geometries. Um, it's not even clear that there's a nice finite uh, classification scheme. But we can certainly, uh, we can construct many examples, and some of them are very interesting. When I told you that uh, the scale invariant uh, rank one geometries just looked like a cone, that wasn't true. It could have been a bouquet of cones, that's also scale invariant. And, and in fact, when you lift the, the regularity condition, you find solutions like that, that look, whose deformation looks like you take a bouquet of cones and then as you deform it, they, they continuously connect to one another with the force of the pimples or just the, the breaking up of this singularity and a bunch of other singularities. Another funny thing that can happen is under deformation, you can grow handles under Coulomb branch. So you can get higher genus Coulomb branches. Neither of these are things that we see in any Lagrangian behavior we see in any Lagrangian. Uh, so, these would be, if they existed, they would be counterexamples to various conjectures people would make in the literature. And there's also a very strange class here where if you take the non singularity and you deform it into a set of singularities. Um, so, uh, this may, I'm not completely sure of this, but this may have an interesting interpretation as this being a really secretly a conformal field theory without a Coulomb branch, which I have coupled trivially to a free vector multiplet, that, so, which has then just a flat Coulomb branch. So it, it's not coupled at all because it's, uh, it's just a conformal field theory which we can't see because it has no Coulomb branch plus a free vector multiplet. And I'm turning, what I'm doing by turning on the deformation is turning on a relevant deformation which does couple them together. This may be a way of getting at, the, at, at questions like whether there exist, uh, can exist conformal field theory, n equals two conformal field theories without Coulomb branches. And there might be the, a hint of evidence now from the n equals two bootstrap stuff that Dean and Rostelli and a lot of collaborators, I forget everybody's name, have been doing in the past couple of years. They found a hint of, for perhaps the existence of a non trivial n equals two. And 
go through this because I'm out of time. But there's also there are very interesting things that you can do to try to move beyond rank one. And um, so I'll just leave that. Thanks you very much. Any questions? Is the result of this that you took the rank of grade school? Is the result of the rank of grade school? Well, right. So in the case, it, first of all, I called it the dimension of the Coulomb branch the rank, but um, just by analogy to the cases when I had a gauge theory. But of course, my classification had nothing to do with the rank, or therefore having any notion of a gauge group. So, um, but what I showed you from our, our result was only for the rank one case for the one dimensional one one dimensional Coulomb branches. Um, to, you can ask yourself, so what's the analog of the Kodaira classification of those cones for rank two? The answer is not known. This is what I was trying to say here, is that you can reduce that classification question to a question of classifying the representation of pi one of the set of, of a class of torus knots in sp 4 which is some algebraic question, which it looks actually doable. It looks like a kind of a finite question. It's not, it's subject to some night, some strong constraints. And uh, it might be a fun problem if someone is algebraic and it's fun. Great question. So if I have two different sort of things, I have to talk the same. Yeah. I, um, okay. Well, the n equals two star theory, right, uh, which is SU two with an adjoint, you could have that. So here's a Lagrangian theory where we could try to answer a question like that. Yeah. Um, well, you could have two different global form forms of the gauge group. You could have SU two or SO three. Both are allowed since it's only adjoint representation. Now, it actually turns out in that case they're the same theory by S two. Weak coupling of SU2, if you go to the strong coupling, it becomes weak coupling of the SO3, it's GNO. But there are other cases where there are distinct, if you went to higher rank, we would even know of Lagrangian cases, where we would certainly not be able to tell the difference at the level of a Coulomb branch from a theory on R4. You'd only find it upon compactification or looking at behavior of some responses to non local operators. Um, but whether there are even more dramatically different conformal field theories, which nevertheless have the same Coulomb branch sector. Okay. No way. Certainly, all we're doing is looking at Coulomb branches to constrain conformal field theories. Do you have to I mean, we didn't we didn't impose that as a condition, but uh, what's that? It could have been an infinite list. It could have been an infinite list. It it um, it turns out uh, that even without our um, uh, even without this conjectural assumption of um, of um, of the lack absence of dangerously irrelevant operators, there would still have been a finite list of possible Coulomb branch geometries consistent with uh, special Kähler, uh, the constraints of special Kähler geometry. The list is long, though, and, and at rank one, the regular ones would have been more, I don't know the exact number, but it would have been more than 200 separate such geometries. Do you have any lists from Laurent? So, you know, for instance, adjust so for the scale invariant Kodaira list, there were seven at rank one. How many scale invariant are there at rank two? Well, like I said, this is the classification, a way of approaching the classification. Other ways have been tried, some by me. And I think people have found now at rank two in the literature, I think more than 35 separate scale invariant regular geometries at rank two. So that's Oh, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, 
um, I think uh, by by <coughs> describing it in, in these in these terms, in terms of this representation theory, the uh, the scale invariant ones have to correspond to so-called elliptic representations, and it turns out that that makes this a finite problem. So it's no, we don't know even how to enumerate it yet. I mean, to how to, uh, to figure out what that number is, but it's certainly. Uh, okay, let's thank the speaker.